So I am Liza Gross. I am Vice President for Newsroom Practice Change at the Solutions Journalism Network. And this means that I am the piece of Solutions Journalism Network that works with news organizations to advance the mission of our um, nonprofit, which is the practice of solutions journalism. Standing right, be oh, yes, standing right behind, behind me or to my side is a member of my team. This is Mikhail Simmons. And we have a couple of other Jean Friedman Rudolski, a, a valuable uh, member of the team and now taking off on her own with her own project. So there are many solutions journalism folks that you can, um, that you can talk to besides me, and I, I want to encourage you to do so. I also am very, very happy to see that in the audience we have some partners, Christy McCudden from Kansas City Public Television, and the, uh, a representative of the organization that has made this all possible, Karen Randlett from the Knight Foundation. Thank you, Karen. The title of this um, presentation is Solutions Journalism Network presents a playbook for collaboration. Mikhail and I were not very happy with the quality of the um, cartoon that we were dreaming up to humorously present the playbook. So I am going to do Havana White myself. And <laughs> this is our collaborative playbook of the reentry project. The reentry project was a year and a half commitment on the part of 15 news organizations in Philadelphia to report on one topic. And it wasn't only news organizations, it was a collaborative that also included academic institutions. So the playbook, which will take up the bulk of my chat, chronicles this journey in detail. A lot of the questions that we got from participants and from other collaboratives that we have worked with at Solutions Journalism Network is, how do I do this? How do I do this? Not a description of the project with the metrics or the outcomes, but who gets to go to the meetings? How often should we meet? If we have a common pot of money, how should we spend it? Who covers what? How do we share? How do we establish protocols to talk to each other? How do we create dynamics that make this a fruitful collaboration? So the spirit, this book was written in that spirit, is to provide anybody interested in a collaborative setting or in a collaborative project, the how to do it with practical details. So this will take the bulk of my chat, but there are two takeaways that I uh, would like to emphasize from this chat. One is the fact that solutions journalism and collaborative and collaboratives are a match made in heaven. So if you are considering a collaborative, we strongly want to encourage you to approach it with a solutions journalism perspective, both from the organizational standpoint, but also as a guiding principle for your journalistic work. And the other that I want to, the other takeaway that I would like you to have from this conversation is what works and what doesn't work in a collaborative. Solutions Journalism Network has, this has been our most ambitious project, but we have worked with over seven, eight, nine collaboratives now, some at the regional level, some at the community level, and some at the state level. And even though every, uh, collaborative has its own particular characteristics, there are some behaviors, shall we say, that we consider productive behaviors and other behaviors that are not so productive in order to ensure the success of a collaborative. May I ask in the audience who has engaged in a collaborative now, so far? Oh, a lot of you, excellent. Now, how many of you have been satisfied with the collaborative experience? Okay, that's fewer, but I am glad that there are some. But also the goal of this uh, presentation is to encourage you to think of the collaborative and convince you that a collaborative experience can be really, really a very productive experience for a news organization and for the community you serve. But first, let me explain what is solutions journalism, since I am proposing that the marriage of solutions journalism and a collaborative is uh, a match made in heaven. 
uh, solutions journalism's rigorous evidence-based reporting on responses to social challenges. I am sure many of you have some uncle, some aunt, uh, some relative or some friend that when you say you're a journalist or when you say you're in journalism, go, oh, I never watch the news. All they talk about is terrible things. I've completely disconnected. So at Solutions Journalism, we try to challenge that uh, by saying, what can we do to cover responses to challenges as well as challenges in order to provide the complete picture of what's going on. This is not Pollyanna, this is not fluff, this is if you cover a societal problem, let's say poverty, let's say high healthcare costs, let's say contamination in your water, let's say achievement gap in your public school system, um, charters versus publics, any, any number of these societal challenges that you also include in your reporting, evidence-based reporting on responses to these challenges. In essence, that you answer, who is doing it better? And can this be replicated in my community if this initiative or this response is happening outside my community? And what is a collaborative? We define a collaborative as two or more news organizations and others, non-traditional partners, working together for the purpose of better informing and engaging their communi community on a topic or area of coverage. I love this definition, which was actually created by the Knight Foundation, not only inform, but engage as well. Audience engagement is a big piece of solutions journalism. And we believe it does produce a better dialogue with your audiences, it better serves your audience's informational needs, and it makes you a better news organization. A couple of years ago, the El Paso Times was reporting, one of our partners, was reporting on hepatitis C in the Hispanic community uh, in El Paso, which makes up over 90% of the total population of El Paso, so that's a pretty significant percentage. Um, the Hispanic community lives longer than any other ethnic community, uh, but hepatitis C is very prevalent, and most Hispanics don't know anything about it and don't get diagnosed. So El Paso Times did a three-part series with a solutions journalism perspective on hepatitis C and creating awareness and what can be done to uh, inform the population better. But then they thought, okay, there's a Univision station here. Why don't we partner with them to amp up the impact of our reporting? There are monolingual populations or populations in El Paso that don't read El Paso Times. And that's what they did. They created a partnership. And that's what got us interested in partnerships and collaboratives to begin with, that modest um, uh, partnership between El Paso Times and the local Univision station. They got incredible results. They got a lot of engagement. They got um, easily measured, for example, the visits from uh, Hispanics to clinics to get themselves tested for hepatitis C skyrocketed as a result of, the, of this series. So um, there was um, a lot of very positive and productive audience engagement. And that's where we started developing the theory that perhaps solutions journalism and a collaborative could be a real powerful tool to cover a given topic. So in comes the collaborative playbook, and in comes Jean Friedman, who was at that time a representative, our network representative in Philadelphia, which meant that she had to introduce solutions journalism to colleagues, uh, organizations, anybody interested in hearing about it. And Jean got together with the Philadelphia Inquirer reporter, Jane Van Bergen, for a drink. And you can read all about that drink here in the collaborative playbook. And out of that grew an idea, what if we reported on the issue of reentry uh, in Philadelphia, prison reentry, incarceration um, or incarcerated citizens or the incarcerated population is a big issue in Philadelphia. And of course, the returning citizens are also a big issue and they normally must face an environment that is hostile and is not prepared to create a positive reentry experience. They cannot get a job, they cannot vote, 
their families reject them, they suffer from PTSD, um, any number of things that really all it does is ensure that they will be back in the, in the prison system uh, because they have failed to have a positive reentry uh, a positive reentry experience so jean jane started inviting other news organizations and started thinking who is doing good work around reentry in philadelphia who is doing it better who is helping ensure that these citizens have a positive experience can get a job can reunite with their families so they extended an invitation, and the original uh, call yielded seven um, news organizations that were interested in participating in reporting jointly on the uh, reentry experience. Now, notice that they did not talk about let's do the criminal justice system or let's do a giant poverty or violence. They zeroed in very concretely on this aspect of the criminal justice system, re-entry. And that's what they were going to report. And so they launched it with the support of Solutions Journalism Network. Our only requirement was that you should approach this project with a Solutions Journalism perspective, which of course they were all willing to do. What is working? How can we inform um, our, the rest of the uh, citizens in Philadelphia what, what is happening that is good in, uh, in the re-entry area? And how can this um, create engagement on the part of um, readers and uh, information consumers? And from there, they took off. Uh, about six months into the project, uh, the Knight Foundation took an interest in it and came in with additional support, made us a grant so that we could re-grant um, some money for uh, the collaborative to spend in extraordinary um, uh, expenses associated with reporting on re-entry. By then, the collaborative had grown to about 15 members, which is where it stayed throughout the collaborative. The single most important achievement of the collaborative will come at the end of this talk. <laughs> but in the meantime, they started reporting on re-entry. One of the metrics that I will release now is that by uh, when the re, uh, when the project was all said and done 200 pieces had been produced around the topic of reentry and a number of community engagements a number of events in the community the last of which the capstone activity um, uh, had over 200 people participating with the attendance of the mayor and individuals from the uh, criminal justice system uh, uh, stakeholders. So, as a result of this, and as a result of other experiences that we have had uh, with collaboratives, I want to share with you what works with a collaborative, in a collaborative. Set clear expectations, and that was something that was presented by other speakers here. I respectfully disagree with my colleague Scott Klein because in the WNC, um, uh, WNYC presentation, he uh, did not put a lot of stock into this, but we put a lot of stock into this. Set clear expectations. Make sure that when you get together with your colleagues from other news organizations, you are perfectly aware of what you're going to do and what they are going to do, and more importantly, what you are not willing to do. Have an independent project editor. If you're a collaborator that has more than four or five members to it, it becomes already unwieldy, and it's extra effort to engage in a collaborative, even though the dividends are good, it's, it requires an extra effort. So an independent project editor, someone who will manage every detail from the editorial calendar to collecting the invoices and making sure that you're spending your budget in a, um, in a timely and reasonable manner, and all the things in between, helping organize the events, calling um, partners when they are supposed to deliver something, asking another partner if they are the ones that, wants to, that want to do the podcast. So the independent project editor's importance cannot be overstated, and it cannot be someone from one of the participating um, groups. It has to be an independent project editor. If you do not have the resources uh, to recruit 
uh, an independent project editor, then someone from one of the participating outlets should be detached and allowed to act as independent project editor, although it's not the ideal situation. Periodic in-person gatherings. Yes, technology is fabulous, and it can serve a number of purposes, but it does not substitute for periodic in-person gatherings where you're eyeballing your colleagues and you are able to really get a feel for where people are at. Uh, it was said by one of the presenters here, collaboratives that at one moment look like they are going swimmingly and the next moment they have crashed. Uh, well, yes, this can happen. And periodic in-person meetings are a big antidote to prevent this from happening. You can ventilate problems, you can express your views, you can have your disagreements. In an email, a disagreement is always a bad thing because it never conveys the meaning that you want to convey. So it's always a good idea to have your periodic in-person gatherings. I always like to say in the, for the Philadelphia Collaborative, for the re-entry project, the first meetings were like, I don't know how many of you are New York City residents, but the first meetings were like a crowded subway car in New York in the summer because this is what you do in a crowded subway car in New York in the summer. Don't look at me, you know, let's not make eye contact. These are all competitors. Philadelphia was a particularly competitive, is a particularly competitive news environment. So the idea of collaborating or standing in a collaboration with their peers was a little bit uncomfortable at the beginning. Uh, and the in-person meeting, meetings were crucial to get over that hump. You want a committed academic partner. There was some talk about whether academic partners are, um, uh, how can they participate? How can they insert themselves? Temple University and Muhlenberg College were key academic partners for the collaborative. Temple University particularly, uh, in the form of Professor Jim McMillan, took on the um, curation, uh, first of all, the creation, and then the curation of the joint website the reentry project website that was created by the collaborative participants. Also for interns, um, design of logos, design of infographics, all of these things uh, can be provided by a good academic partner. Uh, facilities for a meeting, a Temple uh, did not really play that role, or Muhlenberg, but this is an, another way in which a good academic partner can help. Access to funding. I put it down there because one would think that it's always the first thing. Of course, it's always good to have an extra pot of money to engage in any kind of extraordinary project, and especially in a collaborative, which is demanding that you do things that you don't normally do as part of your, as part of your routine. But money is not everything. And once you have it, you need to know how to spend it. The Philadelphia Collaborative, thanks to Jean, who kept total tabs on how money was being spent, uh, knew exactly at every point of the way how much money was left and how did they spend it? What system did they create to spend it? They, had, they, were, they acted like a board. They voted on proposed expenses. So if you were a member of the collaborative and you had an event and you wanted to get money from the common pot, you would present your idea and the members of the collaborative would vote on it. And this was not a rubber stamp. Some of the ideas were rejected, were turned out, or were, were, uh, uh, the person presenting them was asked to fine tune it, uh, diminish the budget, make it a little bit, you know, pare it down a little bit, make it a little bit more realistic. Um, so access to funding is great, but also with that comes the obligation to manage it in a prudent way and to make the most of that, you know, of that money. What are you spending it on? Is, it, is this something that you really need as an extraordinary expense, or can this be taken on by one of the members of the Collaborative? Let's take a podcast. WHYY is one of the participants in the Philadelphia Collaborative, so they can do a podcast. So they don't need to spend from the common pot to um, commission a podcast somewhere else. Some money, the Collaborative spent on trips, reporting trips outside of town, some money was spent on interns. Uh, you can, you know, you have a variety of uh, purposes for this money, but just be mindful on how you spend it. Variety of platforms in a collaborative. If you're all newspapers, or if you're all public radio stations, or if you're all televisions, or if you're all mainstream media with no ethnic 
uh, organizations participating, you are limiting yourselves and you're limiting the potential of your impact, of the impact of your stories and the potential of your interaction with your audiences and the possibility of gaining new audiences. Let's just say, for example, that minority communities in Philadelphia are not great listeners of WHYY. Not many of them listen to WHYY. But as a result of the reentry project, HYY gained traction in minority communities in Philadelphia and was able to reach groups that they normally do not reach. But that is, you know, a variety of platforms helps you with that. And also it's complementary because you have different things you can bring to the table. If you are from those organizations formerly known as newspapers, uh, multimedia organizations, you can bring the writing, you can bring the audio. Uh, Nancy Solomon, I think in her, uh, in, in the recent WNYC presentation, talked about the fact that they contributed a podcast to ProPublica, which was not an expert in podcast production. So variety of platforms is very important. If you want, if you have to choose only two or three partners, make sure that they are complementary to you, not that they are your sibling, but that they are someone that you met in a coffee shop. Uh, joint trainings, and this was raised also by our keynote panel uh, when they had the boot camp for the cross check. Um, a tray, and of course, we do it from the solutions uh, journalism perspective. And this is the value added that we bring. Uh, and it creates a different atmosphere. People get in sync, and they are meeting together to learn something and not in an adversarial, artificial way, you know, ad, ad, people that are not allies or people that represent organizations that are competitors. Well, here they can all meet together in, in an environment where everybody's learning something. Everybody's being given a tool. Everybody is given something useful that will help their reporting, whether they decide to engage in the collaborative or not. If they, after the training, decide that they do not want to be a member of the collaborative, this is fine. But at the very least, they got some additional tools for the toolkit, for the reporting toolkit. Talk early and often about your goals internally. You do not want to create that situation where only three or four people know about the collaborative. The rest of the newsroom doesn't. Your marketing department doesn't. Your um, proposal writers don't. And as a result, you just gain no buy-in uh, from your internal culture and it becomes a slog and it makes others resentful when you take time from your regular routine to participate in collaborative activities. So talk it up early and often internally. See what different newsroom folks are thinking. Some may be very enthusiastic about participating. Others at the very least know about it and know that this is where the newsroom is going and there is total transparency around the project. Talk early and often about goals externally. Start creating your buzz about it. What are you going to be talking about? You're going to be talking about um, achievement gap in the public uh, school system in, from a different angle. You're going to be talking about high uh, health care costs from a different angle. You're going to talk about um, uh, child care uh, from, a, from a different perspective, from a solutions perspective. Build that up. Notify your um, readers, your viewers, your listeners, that you will be coming up with this and that you welcome their feedback and that you want to establish a dialogue. One of the things that irritated me most when I was my managing editor of the Miami Herald was when uh, some uh, editor would come to me telling me that they wanted to do an occasional series. I said, what the hell is an occasional series? I said, imagine this. Imagine you make an appointment with your doctor and you go to your doctor and the nurse says, oh, I am sorry, you know, we only do occasional appointments and this was not the date for you. So we, you know, just, we, we'll let you know when we have an occasional appointment. This is crazy. You're, you know, the consumers of your product or the listeners or the readers need to know when to expect this so that they can engage with this whether to criticize it or whether to think it's great or whether to comment on it or not. But they need to know when it's coming. It cannot be an occasional engagement. <laughs> and the last thing that works very well is give your project a distinctive identity. And that can be done in many ways. When we uh, work with organizations that can have a logo, okay, a logo. 
uh, a public radio station can have a musical theme. Um, you may decide to have a tagline. The, uh, until, they, it developed, uh, until they developed their logo, the participants in the reentry project had a tagline at the end of each story, denoting that this was part of the Philadelphia Collaborative Project. So these are the 10 things that we strongly recommend after working with a number of collaboratives that we see working time and time again. And I, was, I felt very uh, um, happy to hear uh, Gregoire Le, Le Marchand uh, talking about the experience in Crosscheck and there was a lot of commonality between what he was saying. I had never met him before and I did not know the details of the Crosscheck experience, but uh, I was very um, delighted to know that there was a lot of commonality with what we thought worked. So now, what does not work? And we feel that this is just as important to dwell on as what works. A news organization adopting the controlling role, and much less if it's the news organization that has the funding, that has received the funding. Uh, this collaborative will remain unnamed, but this was a collaborative that we interacted with where one news organization was getting a significant amount of funding from a foundation, and no matter how democratic they wanted to make the discussion project, even without realizing, this news organization always stepped in to have the last word and to direct what was going to be done and what the next steps would be, um, and it just did not work. And I am not saying that they didn't even, they may not even known that they were doing it, but of course they had the money. So everybody else was reluctant to disagree and reluctant to uh, put forth a different idea because they felt, okay, you know, X has the money. Ignoring the administrative ex imperatives. This is what we call the scud work. This is something that we journalists hate to do. Um, we have the two big buckets in a collaborative like we have in everything else. One is the admin bucket, which is how is this going to happen? And one is the editorial bucket. And of course, tune. We love to gravitate here because we love to plan the editorial budget. We want to plan the we like to plan the possibilities for coverage. We want to see what images are going to go with this. We love that, and this is what we want to do. But the framework, the scaffolding that is going to support all this effort, also needs to be paid attention to. So, are you going to have an MOU? Are you going to have a set of principles that set forth your collaborative? Who is going to be your fiscal agent if you are not a legal entity? In the case of the uh, reentry project, Solutions Journalism Network was the organization that processed all their invoices and that processed all the financial aspects and accounted for this to the Knight Foundation, which was the main, the main funder. Um, uh, who is going to put together the editorial calendar? What are you going to use to communicate with each other? Does Slack work? Does email work? Uh, will you use Basecamp? Will you use some kind of project management tool? All of these things need to be discussed beforehand. Uh, more strategically, what will be your audience engagement strategy? What are your metrics of success? What, would, what will success look like for this collaborative? Internally and in terms of the impact of your stories. Begin being unrealistic about time commitments. Oh yeah, sure, we can put all this together in a month. Oops, five months later, we're still scrambling and we put something together that is exactly not what we wanted. Be realistic. If it's going to take six months, it's going to take six months. If it's going to take eight, the, from inception to completion, from the time that Jane and Jean had her, their drink in Philadelphia to the closing event, it took a year and a half, almost two years. And there were moments that were lull, you know, there were moments that were frantic, hysteric movement. Uh, there were moments that were, okay, you know, here we're, you know, the, gro the groove is good. We're advancing okay. Uh, it, all of this, you know, there were peaks and valleys, and it, but it took a year and a half. And through it all, the collaboratives stayed with their eye on the ball. And so have most of the collaboratives that we have worked with. Ohio Valley Resource, a collaborative of seven public radio stations in the um, uh, coal region, Ohio, West Virginia, and Kentucky, have been added now also for over a year. They, they are wrapping up right now. A brief overview of that collaborative is in Appendix uh, A here, and the New Mexico collaborative is also here, another brief overview, and this was a state collaborative of very small uh, news organizations throughout the state of New Mexico that, again, for a year, 
reported on a specific project. I know that um, you can think about a short-term project, like an election, as was the case of um, uh, the uh, European Collaborative that was presented this morning. But you can also think about what is it that your community is talking about? What is an intractable challenge for your community at the moment? For Flint, water. For many, um, for my own city of Newark, um, public education, uh, poverty, uh, for Philadelphia, the reentry project. And of course, there are many, many uh, challenges, but what is it that will answer something that your community has been unable to solve? And you come in here with sustained, coordinated, and persistent coverage for a lengthy period of time so that the community can see this problem in a different light and you can dislodge the hopelessness narrative that has been in place since then. Solutions Journalism Network is not always happy, but it's always useful, like we say. And by bringing ideas of what is being done in other places, you open up the dialogue. Suddenly something that was unmanageable, well, I mean, over here they managed it. So how did they do it? How did they do that? And we've worked so far at Solutions uh, Journalism Network with over 150 news organizations. In, uh, in the United States, some collaborative, but many individually. And uh, nobody yet has not been able to find responses for the topic that they were considering. So somewhere, somehow, someone is doing something about whatever challenge or area of coverage you are considering. Lack of a well-defined news project. Sure, you can say we're going to report on poverty which is what the reentry, the second phase of the reentry project is now doing. Or we're going to report on flaws in the public school system. But then you need to get that manageable slice. You need to get to a concrete place where the information can be digestible and you don't turn off your readers. You can allow them to absorb and process the information. So from... Uh, problems in the public school system. We'll have out achievement gap in high school or um, suspension, um, as this was done by the Seattle Times. Uh, they um, saw that Seattle, the Seattle public school system was pretty punitive um, and used suspension uh, pretty frequently. And what happened is then the students couldn't get back in the school. So what do you think the result of that was? Well, that was the way of ensuring that they would drop out and move on to a life of crime, or at least a, a, a life that did not achieve the potential that it was meant to achieve. So they looked at other places where they were using other tools that were less punitive than suspension or instead of suspension. And they reported steadily on that. And eventually, the city of Seattle changed its policy and cancel the idea of uh, um, suspensions as, as a viable form of um, getting problematic students uh, into line or solving the problem of problematic students. But you need to define that. The reentry project did not say problems in the criminal justice system. They could have chosen something else. There were many of them. But they chose reentry, reentry. And this reentry for men and women, but reentry. No clarity beyond the basic reason for coming together. You know, we journalists are very social people. We like to be with our crowd and we like to sit and kick around ideas. Um, but we need to be clear about why we're coming together. We're coming together to report on this for an X period of time. And then all of a sudden this makes the commitment clear and manageable. And then you can answer the question, do I want to be in or do I want to be out? Which you can make that choice. But if you're in, then you know what you're in for. Trying to do it all, that's another hallmark of uh, our professional group, particularly for those of us that come from those organizations formerly known as newspapers. Oh, we can do it all. We have no experience on how to do a podcast, but uh, like, how difficult can it be? Or, you know, we can do some uh, new, you know, interactive tools online. Well, we've never used them, but so what? I mean, let's see. Da, 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 da. Or we have an 18-year-old over there. Let's ask him to come over and, and see what he or she can do about this. No, but why do that when, if I am a newspaper, I can partner with WNYC and they can provide my podcast for me. And they are certainly going to do them much better than I can. 
They have an expertise in this. And we can provide them things that normally uh, a radio station, uh, it's not a radio station strength. So let's get over this trying to do it all. And of course, this goes to the point of resources. We're always complaining. We don't have time and we don't have resources. But if we get a little creative and if we think in a collaborative, how we can leverage the strengths of the various partners who would be doing this anyway. It's very likely that WNYC would have been doing a podcast about a story and we, as a newspaper, would have been writing a story about it. It's very likely we don't have to go to another planet in order, you know, we don't have to uh, look at skills that we don't normally do or outside our routine. So let's get over this trying to do it all. The prolonged planning, we came across another collaborative that discussed this so long, and they had the enthusiasm and the buying of each of their newsrooms. But by the time they got around and made a decision on the topic, and first of all, it wasn't a collaborative decision, it was a decision made by um, at the, the community foundation that was involved and a number of um, newsroom leaders. And by the time they made a decision, the newsroom was totally deflated. They just didn't want to do it anymore. And they had been waiting for eight months to hear what is it that we're going to do. And they were primed and they were going to do it. And we're launching the collaborative. Well, eight months later, you know, the baby didn't come. It was nine months and we had no birth. So they were so deflated that by the time they took off, you know, there was a certain loss of enthusiasm and, and you know, there was no charge to it. They did engage in it, but there was no charge. It took a long time to regain that, that en enthusiasm. You know, uh, for the 10 things that work, we talk about resources. And now we're going to talk about lack of resources. And of course, this is a fact. This is a fact for not only for smaller newsrooms. I would submit to you that many um, newspapers now are in pretty dire straits um, and uh, cannot engage in uh, ambitious uh, projects that take them too far afield from um, what is the basic thing that they want to do. However, however, in the 150 newsroom engagements that I have had so far in these three and a half years uh, in my tenure at uh, Solutions Journalism Network, I've seen tiny startups. I am talking about Newsroom 3, editor, reporter, inter, doing wonderful Solutions Journalism series. Uh, this particular that I am mentioning is the uh, Texas Observer. And they did a solution series on humane treatment of undocumented workers or more humane forms of treatment of undocumented uh, individuals. Again, three. Uh, the Richland Source, I encourage you to look at their website, a digital startup in Richland, Ohio. Uh, team five, incredibly creative, incredibly creative, not only in terms of approaching their journalistic work, but also the way in which they engage with their readers and uh, with their community. Uh, part of their Solutions Journalism series on uh, maternal mortality. Um, Ohio is one of the states with the highest rate of maternal mortality, and Richland is the county with the highest rate of maternal mortality in Ohio. So they did a Solutions uh, Journalism series on this, and it involved a baby shower a baby shower that was attended by over 200 expectant mothers and partners and family where they had secured the participation of um, nonprofits in the area and free clinics. And so the mothers got information. They had their blood pressure checked. There were a variety of uh, services that they could access at that baby shower. But also, they became acquainted with the um, journalistic series because the Richland Source used this baby shower as a way to promote their series and as a way to get new readers and new people interested in, in what they were doing. Oh, Jean Son, there you are, I'm sorry, another partner, WHYY. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, another example that I would like to bring is the Chicago Reporter, tiny startup in Chicago, African American, and they focused on um, settlements of out of court settlements on police brutality cases in Chicago. Something that, of course, the Chicago Police Department had no interest in tracking, but that was costing the city of Chicago or Chicago taxpayers a ton of money because the, the money for the settlements came from the coffers, the city coffers. And so they had to build a website, use a, a database 
crowdsourcing folks. They just threw out the question in the communities and say, who has had an experience with an out-of-court settlement? Now, again, Chicago Reporter, three in the newsroom, and they were able to do this. So lack of resources isn't necessarily something that will stop you. It indeed makes things more difficult, but, but it's not something that should stop you. Not developing a metrics plan from the get-go. And this is something that you know uh, the, the reentry project uh, could have you know could have worked a, a little bit better on. Um, it is important to define what will success look like at the end of this. What do we want to create? Do we want to create awareness of this issue? Uh, do we want to see if we can affect some changes in public policy? Um, do we want to gain a new segment of readers, viewers, uh, listeners? What is it that we want to do? And we can have all the metrics need to be more or less realistic, but you know, they can be ambitious, they cannot be ambitious, but at least you get a sense of what it is that you are, you know, where, how are you setting your editorial agenda and how are you reaching out with your audience engagement component? But you need to do this from the start. If you, for example, the Boston Globe, when we work with them, wanted to know, they did a, a solution series around education and around um, the achievement gap in, in public schools in, um, in Boston and challenges that the Boston, uh, new challenges that the Boston uh, public school system was facing with the arrival, the influx of refugees from conflict zones. They have never seen this before. Uh, children from Bosnia, children from African countries where there was conflict and they did not know how to deal with. So before they started, you know, the Boston Globe was interested in knowing what do the education people know about this and how could we inform them better? And this went from public officials, the school board, to teachers. So they had a survey of these specialized stakeholders and asked them general questions around these topics, which were the topics that they wanted to pursue as part of their solutions journalism series. And at the end, they went back to this group and asked them the same question. Do you feel more informed as a result of this series? Do you feel you have different tools to make different decisions? Have any of our stories made you change your mind about how you approach this or that initiative? So have a sense from the get-go of where you want to go with your metrics plan and the tools that you're going to use to measure it. Not every tool is a good tool for the job. We don't use a hammer to embroider uh, doily. So just Think about what tool is the best tool for you and what tool will reflect what your goal is accurately. And try to go beyond, you know, everybody can access Google Analytics, can else, but try to go beyond that and see there are such a variety now of interesting metrics tools that gain you insights into um, uh, the uh, reporting that you're doing and can enrich your reporting and can send you in much more interesting directions. So take the time to, you know, to look at that. Um, you know, Gina and I were talking that for the next iteration, um, the uh, folks in Philadelphia want to look at the use of language, the use of stigmatizing language, and whether through the reporting one can change the use of stigmatizing language around a given topic and thus effect you know, a mind change uh, in the discussion of this issue. Uh, and lastly, the inability to overcome technolo technolo technological barriers. Oh, you can't read it all. Oh my God. Well, to communications, to internal communications. Uh, many of our um, collaboratives did not think this through at the beginning, and they face significant challenges uh, for internal communication. Um, Slack may not have worked, they had different platforms, even not only for the exchange of information about what they were doing, but also to share content. Because some of them have the joint website, you can go that route, which is the route that the reentry project uh, elected to go in, but others publish only in their own, uh, in their own platforms. And because there was incompatibility, and, and some of these were public radio station to public radio station. You know, I'm, I'm not talking about uh, newspaper and uh, television. Uh, but there was uh, difficulties in um, making the material flow uh, with ease. So look at, you know, look at your technological challenges from the get-go, see how they can be resolved, or they can torpedo your um, collaborative project. 
The collaborative, a collaborative is an interesting endeavor that can yield a lot of results. And it's difficult and challenging enough without engaging in any of these uh, activities that can definitely ensure that you're not going to be able to um, have success in what you are, you know, in what you're doing. So back to the reentry project and the participants there. What was the single most valuable outcome? Well, there were many outcomes for the uh, uh, reentry project, and they are all listed here, uh, divided into two big buckets. The internal outcomes, in other words, the mindset change among news professionals. News professionals learn to work with a solutions journalism perspective, learn to work in teams, became acquainted with tools, with reporting tools that they were unfamiliar with, uh, became acquainted with metric tools that they were unfamiliar with. So they gained a lot of knowledge, and they also gained uh, content that they would not have been able to produce otherwise. So this was a gain for the newsrooms. The impact, well, the reentry project achieved a lot of impacts in the community in terms of awareness of the reentry um, process, in terms of um, incorporating or destigmatizing uh, the experience of um, uh, prisoners or uh, citizens re-entering. Oh. oh, you were trying to fix it? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, um, and a number of programs were continued or were started uh, as a result of the work of the re-entry project. Um, so um, employers expressed an interest or uh, a willingness to look at uh, former um, uh, incarcerated folks to join the workforce. So it had a number of very positive um, impact in the community. But again, which one was the most important, the most valuable for us, for Solutions Journalism Network and for, for the collaborative? That every single participant in the reentry project signed up to do it all over again. And they now have gone into the second phase not only have they signed up to do it all over again and set up an independent hub of solutions-oriented news, but they are also doing their own fundraising and they have secured to date $200,000 to work on for the next year. They already have a calendar, they already an editorial calendar, they already know what they want to do, and they are all back there again. And it was a long slog. It was a year and a half. And sometimes it was moments of depression and frustration. And uh, no, no, Jean, right? You're shaking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and some tension moments, you know, we had big newsrooms, we had little newsrooms. Uh, some issues were ventilated around, you know, concerns around uh, editorial standards, and, and all of this was hashed out. All of this was, you know, we had good therapy sessions, and it all was overcome, and, and uh, the collaborative moved forward, and it moved forward again. And also, I understand, it's now not only 15 participants, but it's 19 participants. And news organizations that declined to join the first round are now in. And this, for us, for Solutions Journalism Network, and I hope that for Resolve Philly, which is the new name of the Philadelphia Collaborative, also uh, means something really great. We saw this as transformational, and we think that Resolve Philly will have a lot to contribute to the community and will do great collaborative journalism, solutions journalism moving forward. Um, the book goes through the timeline of uh, in, in a sort of a telenovela form. Uh, then it talks about what worked and what didn't for the collaborative. It talks about what works and what doesn't work in general. And then it has two appendixes where we offer a brief overview of two other projects and the other appendix where we have collected all the documents that the Philadelphia Collaborative, now Resolve Philly, created from scratch in order to uh, make the collaborative work. For example, their MOU, for example, their statement of guide guiding principles, uh, a template for uh, requesting funding, um, 
there are a number of, uh, oh yeah, a, a budget, hello, <laughs> how they were going to spend their common pot of money, um, and, um, and an editorial calendar. So we hope that, you know, by sharing them with you, if you are considering a collaborative initiative, you just don't have to start from scratch. You can sort of adapt and use some of the, uh, some of the documents that, um, you know, that are contained in the um, collaborative playbook. And with that, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, I am Lisa Gross, and please, I would like to encourage you to join the hub um, for, of Solutions Journalism Network. There you will find all our resources, including the collaborative playbook, which you can download. Um, and all of our other resources are free and available. We have toolkits um, on how to do solutions journalism uh, for the main toolkit for editors, education solutions journalism. We will soon have one on engagement, on audience engagement. We're planning one on metrics. We have plenty of uh, case studies and webinars that you can look at and uh, get some ideas from on how some things were done, um, how our partners carried out their solutions journalism project alone or in their collaborative setting. So thank you so much and we will be here, Mikhail and I, uh, Jean and uh, uh, Jean and <laughs> uh, and Delaney Butler who is attending another uh, another uh, seminar at the, another workshop at the moment. So if you have any further questions, we will be glad to answer them and and talk with you further. But if you have any questions now and we have time, I am um, I don't know whether we have any additional time. I will be glad to take them now. Yes, we don't know of any collaborative that has incorporated as a participant um, a university paper, a college paper. Uh, but we know of many collaboratives that have a relationship with a professor. Typically, that's how it comes about. A journalism professor that is interested in solutions journalism. And so ideas are kicked around on what kind of contribution can the students make. In the case of uh, the uh, reentry project, uh, the dean of the School of Journalism in Temple, David Boardman, is a great champion of solutions journalism and a great champion of Philadelphia. And he was very keen on having students participate at any level. And so students were interns, students worked on the uh, website, some of them contributed some stories uh, under the guidance of uh, Professor Macmillan. So that's typically how it comes about. Now, it's very interesting. You might want to think of a collaborative of college newspapers. And uh, you might want to throw out an invitation to your peers and see who wants to, in New Jersey, who wants to think of a collaborative of college newspapers. I am looking forward to that project. I will be checking up on you. <laughs> Excellent. We will check on that. Any other questions? Yes, Kimi. Yes, I would say there are several stages to that. Uh, this was a large and ambitious collaborative with 15 uh, participants. Now, the advantage, of course, was it was in one market. So everybody lived you know, within 15 or 20 minutes of each other or whatever, or their news organizations were. So, so the logistics from that standpoint were, were easy to arrange. Uh, it is a little bit more challenging if you're at a regional collaborative or even at a state collaborative, which is what New Mexico faced, getting you know all the... Uh, participants together in person was a little bit of a challenge. A lot more of the discussion was um, uh, uh, online. Now, Solutions Journalism Network, if you want to do a collaborative uh, with a solutions journalism perspective, which we encourage you to do, um, we act very much as a convener. We help at, in the initial phases of putting together that uh, framework, we, which is what I am doing now actually with two different collab uh, potential collaboratives, one in New Hampshire and one in Connecticut. 
And uh, it can take, depending on the ambition and uh, scope of your project, it can take uh, one to two months or it can take three to four months. Both of these groups have been working for about four months now. And one of them is pretty close to a proposal, I would say like for next week. The other one still, I would say has a couple of weeks to go or, or a month even for until they have the proposal gel. They are still looking for more partners. And both are state collaboratives. Yes. Constructive potential. I was curious on your thoughts on how to move it from a very compelling alleyway of journalism to a more normative uh, <laughs> you know, way of, way of approaching the practice. This is a great question. And actually, uh, we are wrestling with that strategic question at Solutions Journalism Network. Because of course, at the core, what our goal is, is to change the mindset of journalists, of our peers, and get them to embrace Solutions Journalism as a practice. But we're also cognizant that, we, that Solutions Journalism asks different questions, provides different answers, and has the potential to be very transformational in terms of creating a new dialogue, a new different dialogue in the community. So we've been working with that. And we actually have now um, an, an initiative that we call Solutions U, which is directed at academics that are not in journalism schools, but that, that are in um, careers or degrees that encourage societal change. And we are working with them to create packages of solution stories in their particular areas, let's say climate change, that they can use in class. So we are seeing that we can have other applications, not only talking to our peers, but of course our main goal is to talk to our peers and, and convince our peers to do journalism differently. But the audience engagement part and the kind of impact that you think you're going to have in the community is a must for solutions journalism. It's not, you know, you don't sit there and write about what you like, but you want to see what, where is the challenge in your community? Where is the conversation at? And that's what you want to um, participate in. All right, last question before we wrap up, because we just got the signal. Can you talk a little bit more about your process? Um, it sounds like you're sort of a matchmaker. <laughs> That is a great description, yes. <laughs> OK, so, so you help bring collaborators together. You help them put together a project proposal. And then you fund them. They basically submit a grant proposal to you. Is that how it works? Yes, let me, uh, let me address that. Um, let me first address that, uh, the fact that we don't bring newsrooms together. They have to want to come together. We are not prescriptive. If you have no interest in participating in a collaborative, we can't make you. I mean, we just, there is no, and if you have no interest in participating in a collaborative, you shouldn't be there. Uh, the participants uh, of the reentry project all had great interest in doing this. They were all very committed. Even if sometimes throughout the project, they may have repented of this decision, but they, you know, <laughs> in the end they did not. And, and it, it, they, they wanted to be there. So what we encourage is the news organizations, and this is what's happening uh, at the moment in the New Hampshire Collaborative, or Wannabe Collaborative. We were approached, or we were introduced, to two newsrooms. And we proposed to them the idea of gathering a statewide collaborative around the topic that they wanted to do, to amp up the impact of their reporting. For their particular topic, we have funds that we can make available to them if they want to embrace this collaborative with a solutions journalism perspective. Some collaboratives do not receive funds from us, but many collaboratives do. We are funded by funders, and some of them are your standard usual suspects that always fund journalism, the Knight Foundation, the Ford Foundation, but we're also funded by um, uh, foundations like the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, who has a big interest in violence or uh, in health issues. So they come to us and say, we would like journalists to um, elevate their level of understanding around health issues and look at health issues with a, journal with a solutions perspective. Can you find these partners? They never get involved. We are the ones that work with the news organization. So they grant us and we grant them. And so, for some projects, we have many, many newsrooms that 
are not funded by us. They just say, we want to embrace solutions journalism. And we want to do it on climate change. Oh, well, we don't have any funds to give you. It doesn't matter. We just want to learn how to do solutions journalism. But yes, we are in the wonderful position to be able to provide funding in, on many, you know, in many instances. Time is up here, but uh, and, uh, we will have a break soon. And I, I will be happy to talk some more. And I was very, very proud to see that in the video that uh, was showed at the beginning of um, uh, the conference by uh, the collaborative, by Stephanie and her team. Three of the people featured there were from projects that were solutions journalism projects. So thank you very, very much. And I am around to talk.